Hey, it's Jeff Dolan, and I have a special interview for you with Sahil Lavinia, the CEO of Gumroad and author of the new book, The Minimalist Entrepreneur. To listen to the full interview, head over to jeffdolan.com. I hope this inspires you to grow and create. Let's jump in. I think there's a lot of value that your experience brings to our audience because there's a lot of our audience that they're podcasters, they're entrepreneurs, they are small business owners. Uh, some of them are entrepreneurs working for larger corporations that have side hustles. They're doing artistic pursuits on the side. There's a lot of folks that really need to hear what you have to say, right? Because you've been there, you've done that. And, and actually you've done the things that a lot of us want to do, which is you have a sustainable lifestyle where you can explore things like art. So break down the book. So what was the reason why you felt now is the time to write the book? Yeah. I thought about it for a while. I initially was kind of hesitant because I, you know, I don't want to write like a book just to write a book. But over time, as I talked to more people, I felt like, yeah, I had like a unique sort of perspective or view of the world. And I had a unique path to getting there and I can write pretty well. And I, and I had a lot of free time. So I was like, what else am I going to do with my time? And so that's kind of initially what, what got me into it. And then eventually, like, as I started writing the book, I realized like, the goal was for basically me to stop spending my time at helping people one by one. It just takes too long. I don't really have enough time. There's too many people who DM me on Twitter every day. <laughs> and so I think now I have an asset that I can say, Hey, you're asking me about how I started selling in the early days. Like here's a chapter on sales or marketing. Here's a chapter on marketing or building. Here's a chapter on building everything. I feel like I have to say about starting and scaling a, a sort of sustainable software business is in that book in 52,000 words. And so. Also help people, but you know, I think I will have a, a little bit of a barrier to make sure that people, when they do ask for help, all the surface level, all of my easy answers they've already read and consumed, and they'll ask better questions, and I'll be able to give them better answers. Yeah, it's a good cultural asset to have, right? It consolidates all your thoughts really well in one place. So, what would you say is your main message of the book? Yeah, I think the main message is start then learn. I think there's a lot of people who just don't want to start. They think that they need to know more than they actually do to start. And so I think the kind of core, the first message, at least of the book is like the, the thing that's stopping you is, is yourself, not anything else, you know, enough to get started. You just don't want to, for whatever reason, that might be fear. That might be laziness. I think for most people, it's probably fear. The other way I kind of think about the book is as an excuse minimizer. There are a bunch of excuses people have for why they don't start. And I just think most of them are BS. And so I wanted to write a book that reduces all of the excuses that they have. I only want to publish things that can help hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And so I write a lot. And most things just don't get to that level where I'm like, this is not that helpful. I want to write for myself, but I don't want to publish for myself and my ego. I only want to hit publish when I'm like, yes, this is adding something to the canon of humanity. Interesting then. So using that metric, how do you look at and approach releasing art? Yeah, art is very... My painting specifically is very different where the art is purely for me. Like, I don't know you know, why anyone follows me for it, but that is really to keep me accountable to continuing the habit and staying consistent. Hmm. And that's how I started writing too, is I initially was for me, I just wanted to write a lot so that I could improve as a writer and get feedback, which you need to do, I think, right? Like I've been writing publicly for I think my first blog post was 2008. Right. It's been 13 years. Like, so when people are like, I'm not a good writer, I'm like, yeah, well, come back to me in 13 years. <laughs> it takes time. Not that I've been writing super consistently at that time. Otherwise, it probably would have been a little bit faster. But for example, I've never, I've never made an art piece that I wanted to get consumed by hundreds of thousands of people. Hmm. Even though I have that audience, except maybe you could argue my like Twitter profile picture or something like that. But I want to at some point, you know, um, and I'm getting, yeah. I'm trying to get as good as possible at drawing and painting in order to be able to have the skills to do that once I have the right idea. But it's kind of faith-based. It's like, I don't know what that is. I just know that I want to continue to get better at the fundamental skills of communication, writing, design, engineering, product, marketing. And when I do have good ideas, then I will have the right 
sort of skill set to be able to make them, you know, succeed in the marketplace as much as, much as possible. Yeah, it sounds like you kind of have that balance where you do your art for yourself and you do your business stuff to help the world or help others. Is that a good way to maybe frame it? Yeah. And I've also said this really well, which is like you either do things for yourself or for other people. And the way that I think about it is I either do stuff purely for myself or I do stuff purely for other people. I, like, I think there are certain things that like are really fun, but like they're not rewarding to anybody else. <laughs> Playing Rocket League is not going to add any value to the world, but I enjoy it. Gumroad, I consider a service to the world. It's not really meant to kind of... I mean, it does end up doing things that I want to do. I kind of can cheat a little bit because it's a private company and it's small and I run it. But certainly, you know, if we raise a bunch of venture capital and things like that, then it's not about you, right? It's not about the founder. It's about optimizing for improving the world and value creation. And ultimately, a portion of that should be value capture. Otherwise, you're no one's going to want to invest. So you can continue to have the impact that you have. Like Zuck's not running Meta for himself. He's doing it because he believes that it's what the world needs. It's almost like a servant mentality, which I think is pretty cool. Do you look at that kind of work as part of your art or do you look at it separate from your creative side? It's ideally separate. I don't think Gumroad is like a portfolio piece in that way, right? Where Gumroad is more functional... I could do much more interesting work if, you know, without the constraints of it. But Gumroad is, yeah, kind of a, a vehicle for me to show people how you can run a company in this weird new way, raise money in this new way, market in this new way. Right. And so it's really kind of just an example is kind of how I think about it. It's like, I just want to show people how to do these things. And, the, you know, I can write a book, but ultimately the best way is to just show people by doing it. Right. Right. There are very few business books that are written by active CEOs of companies. Most of the time, you're one or the other. You're either running a company or you have time to write a book. Right. The way I've run Gumroad, I've been able to to do both. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I was looking at your LinkedIn. It's like part-time founder and CEO. <laughs> and, uh, part-time founder, part-time author, part-time investor is how I right. think. Right. Yeah, which is actually some could argue that that's not focusing, but your lifestyle is probably way better than most people that are stressed out, focused on one thing. (laughs) Yeah, I think of it as portfolio diversification, right? But for your happiness. Yep. You don't want one thing to be in control of your happiness. Certainly, like Gumbra does make me happy at times, but I think if it was the only thing, then as it was previously, then yeah, it's a. It's a little risky, you know, just like you shouldn't let your fitness be the single barometer of your happiness or your family. You kind of want a portfolio of happiness providers. In terms of long-term sustainability, I do think focus is important. And certainly I am a one-track mind. I can focus 100% on Gumroad for an hour and then focus 100% on my VC stuff for an hour and then focus 100% on my book stuff for an hour. It's not like I'm doing all three at the same time, which I think is an important distinction. And I think a lot of people are actually more capable of this than you might think. I mean, you look at a freelancer, right? A freelancer is has multiple clients at the same time. We don't think freelancers are like some amazing creature. Or you look at people who are like athletes, but they also have a blog. A basketball player is a good example, I think. How much of their time is dedicated to the sport of basketball? I don't know. My guess is four hours a day. Even if they're like working a full workday, they have four hours of quote unquote free time. Obviously, they probably spend that on auxiliary things, but there's a lot of time there. I don't even get close to four hours to work on Gumroad a day. I can't do highly leveraged work at Gumroad for four hours. If I wanted to do four hours of work, I would do like 10 minutes or 20 minutes of highly leveraged work. And then I would be doing stuff that I could hire someone to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So it just kind of keeps me honest. And you know, the other thing is like, I'm not starting a company, right? So it's a little different that you can't get here on day one. Right. But certainly 10 years in or much sooner, I got there eight years in, I think seven years in something like that. But yeah, it's, it's funny. Like when people ask me, like, how do you have time to write a book? How do you have time to be a VC? You're deploying ten million dollars a year. Like that's not small. You have a company that you run. You tweet a lot. You travel. You know, you do all these sorts of things. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just really good at delegating. I'm just really good at saying I'm okay not doing it after the first point, right? And I, I probably have some, maybe some I don't know innate talent or something for like context switching or something like that. I generally don't get stressed out. I don't think like, oh my gosh, I have like seven things I have to do this week. I just do it. In terms of time, I think it's it's quite possible for many people. 
I think it's a more of a question of attention, energy, focus, stamina, endurance, things like this, right? Like for example, everyone has time to run a half marathon, right? Mm. Three months from now, they can run a half marathon if they wanted to. Uh, in terms of time, they might not have the energy, they may not want to or whatever, but most people, you know, it's probably what, like 50 hours of running to train for a half marathon and then a two hour or so, you know, commitment. Like most people have 50 hours, you know, that's like a few hours a week, but how many people do it? Very, very, very few, right? Not to say everyone should, but I do think it's, you know, people say, Oh, I can't do this. I don't have time. And I'm like, okay, tell me what happened at the end of game of Thrones. And I'm like, okay, well, if you can tell me that, then you've watched 300 hours of game of Thrones. <laughs> so you have time. <laughs> Yeah. And I think it's people balancing a lot of the fear, the context switching, the excuses, the chasing happiness in things that are fleeting, not achieving their goals, right? It's like they're spreading themselves out so thin. At the end of the day, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and be like, I don't actually want that thing that I say that I want. <laughs> Correct. 100%. It's a great thing. If you can admit to yourself, hey, truly admit to yourself, right? Not like, I don't want that, but then you feel crappy anyway. Right. <laughs> like, for example, this was me. I can give you a real example for me because some people, they're like, oh, wow, you can do all these things. Like, what can't you do? Um, I'm like, a lot of things. <laughs> for example, music. Like, I don't listen to music and I don't watch sports. I just don't do them. You know, like I watch sports like once every four years for the World Cup or something like that. I just don't want to. You know, I tried. Like, I tried getting into piano. And I just learned that I don't really want to. <laughs> and I don't wake up. I'm like, oh, I, I don't feel guilty about it. Right. I just say, that's just not something I really want to do that badly. Or like skiing and snowboarding. When I first moved to Utah, I was like, oh, I'm going to get really into skiing and snowboarding. And I tried pretty aggressively. Went a bunch of times in a season. And, and then I just had to be real with myself. Like if I have an hour free tonight, or if I have three hours free in the morning or whatever, like. I'm not thinking about, oh, I want to go skiing for two hours or an hour. <laughs> right. I'm thinking about, oh, I'm going to go like go to the coffee shop and read a book or write or grab breakfast with a friend or whatever. Right. And so I think part of it is, I think society kind of says, oh, you have to do these things or you should be doing these things. And yep. it's all up to you. Like you have to figure out what you want. Yep. What do you really, really want? I think Nabal had a good way of framing this. He said something like the only two questions in life that matter are like, what do you want? And did you get it? Hmm. Which, yeah, it's like, what do you want? And then did you actually get it or not? Ideally, you want fewer things because it's easier to, to succeed when you have fewer things that you want. And yeah, for me, I have like three buckets. I know this about myself. And so it makes it a lot easier to know that, okay, I have what I want. And I can tell you the three buckets are Gumroad. Like the bucket is founder, which is like, I want to sort of start businesses. Second is investor. I want to invest. Uh, and then third is creator, which is like my painting, my writing, like all fits into that. And so if, as long as I'm doing all three of those... My guess is I will always at some level need to be doing all three of those at the same time. I will always be like pretty satisfied. Obviously, there are other things I care about, like my family and, and relationships and being healthy and, and other things. But I think in terms of my sort of occupational, you know, how I spend my quote unquote nine to five, right? Yeah. Those are sort of the three buckets. And it means that like, I don't have to be painting all the time. I don't have to be writing all the time. I don't have to be making music all the time, but I do have to be doing... One of those things. One of the buckets. Yeah. You know, like I took a break. I didn't paint almost at all at, in 2020. And like, if you go to my Instagram accounts, like I was painting like literally every day or every few days. And then basically literally zero for a whole year. But it's fine. I'm not looking to be yeah. a professional painter. I'm, I call myself an irregular painter. <laughs> I was writing a book for Penguin. So, you know, I was busy. And I, and again, it was like, at first I felt a little guilty. It was like, oh, I'm not keeping up that habit. But then I was just real with myself. Like, I'm doing it for fun. I don't really have an end goal, which is actually great. It's kind of nice not to have an end goal. It's like, I just go and draw and get better. But that was self-inflicted guilt, right? Like, you didn't have anybody in your social network telling you like... No, no, no. Yeah, totally self-inflicted guilt. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like what I found is like, no one really cares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, no one cares. Like... It's not like if I didn't write a book, people would have been like, oh, you should have written a book or like, you know, it's just yeah. people see what you do and then they like your things every once in a while on social media. But everyone's kind of preoccupied with themselves, their life, their their arguments, their political things. Even more today, though, right? 
Yeah. Like it. It's like, you know, people say, Oh, I don't want to go to the gym. Like, or, you know, people are going to look at me and I'm like, don't worry. Everyone is obsessed with themselves, including yourself, which is why you have this concern in the first place. Right. So if you assume that everyone else has your same problem, then actually you shouldn't have a problem because everyone else would be concerned with the exact same issue and no one would pay attention to you. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I kind of, I kind of believe that pretty strongly. Like, I'm sure there are some people out there that do pay attention and they're like, Oh, Saho's tweeting some stupid thing again. But like, the truth is like the fact that they care means I shouldn't. Right. Because like the people that I should care about are people who are like me and appreciate me and respect me. And sometimes, yeah, they will give me some feedback if they really believe that I'm not aligned with what my goals actually are. Right. They might call me out on it, but generally it's not the strangers at the gym or, you know, whatever that are really the ones that you need to be thinking about all the time. Right. Yeah. Cause their opinion is not really relevant <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. And they, they don't really know you. Right. And that's how I think about it. It's like, look, I get emails from people at some scale of an audience, a small percentage of them are kind of mean. And so I get emails and DMs that are like, you suck or you scam people or this or that. And I think it's more about them than it is about you is what I've, what I've found generally. That's what helped me in the last several years when I started understanding and reading a lot on mental health a good amount of people are struggling with all sorts of different kinds of mental health. Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate, but if you think about, there'll be some article about like, all these people are upset about this or that. And I'm like, we don't know. <laughs> Statistically, we have no idea. This, Yeah. 50 people seem to be upset, but my guess is most people are not that upset at most things. And I've found this to be true where like there'll be some issue in the startup community or something like that. Like for example, the base camp thing, right? Like base camp got canceled like in March or whatever, when they said no politics at work or what have you. Right. I went to a startup conference this week, which is literally for bootstrapper type people. And there's basically nobody canceled them. People understand that there's nuance. People understand generally that people make mistakes. I would say that the biggest problem with that whole thing is the fact that people put them on this pedestal in the first place. Right. Like all the people getting upset are like, Oh my gosh, I thought Basecamp was such an amazing company. And I'm like, it's a freaking business run by two dudes who kind of do whatever they want. Right. They're worth insane amounts of money. Like it's like when people get mad at MailChimp all of a sudden for selling for $12 billion, you were literally shouting from the rooftops that this was an amazing business model because they didn't take any VC. And then all of a sudden you're <laughs> angry that they didn't give equity to people. It's like a little weird to me. Again, I'm not saying that they did the right thing or not. I think the way that I'm handling Gumroad is, is sort of better, but... But this is the same dynamic that we're talking about, right? I have this rule now, which is basically like if someone has negative feedback or critical feedback for me, I will only take it seriously if they are someone that I respect, that I love, and that is not anonymous, right? Like someone who is taking real accountability. The people who just go on Twitter and say, Sahil did this bad thing, like he's an idiot, like... I just don't listen to them. It, it just doesn't, it's, it's useless. And like, even at the at Gumroad back in the day, I would tell people like, look, I never want anyone to use somebody else's name. If you have a problem, don't say, Oh, this other person said there's a problem. I thought you should know. Like that's unacceptable to me. One, I can't prove it. It just, it just introduces like negative energy without any value. Cause I can't do anything about it. Right. And I think it's a terrible precedent to set. Like, I think if you truly care, tell me, yeah. I promise you, I will not fire you. You know, like, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be easy for you to do. But I do think if you want a healthy company, you have to be willing to have some real skin in the game, right? This is why I don't really get on online arguments anymore, right? Because it's like, no one has any skin in the game. We're just yep. shouting at each other. Right. Guess what? In real life, you're not going to do that because there's a real non-zero chance that you can get punched in the face. <laughs> It's entertaining. It, this is the other thing. I kind of learned this from Gary V back in the day. It's like some people just, it, it's entertainment for them. It is 100%. <laughs> yeah. If you think about what social media replaced, it replaced TV. It replaced entertainment. And so, and it, you know, it competes with entertainment all day long, right? Right. Like what is Netflix? What is sports? What is probably politics? Like it's mostly entertainment. You just, you should just understand it. Like, oh, these people actually like hating on you. Like they actually get <laughs> fulfillment out of this. Again, like, as you mentioned, like people generally get what they want in a way. Right. And so this is what they want. They yeah. want me to get mad. They want me to say, no, you're wrong. I did it. Like that just feeds the beast. I think the best possible it. thing you can do is just ignore them. Yeah. You, you have to have really strong filters today for sure. 
And you have to have a very balanced ego that doesn't get offended because a lot of what the content that people create is trying to get a reaction. It's trying to get your attention. It's competing for attention. How do you look at the marketing part and kind of what are your thoughts on that process? Yeah, I have a chapter in the book, chapter five, I think called Market by Being You. But I try to pick projects that if I do need to market them, sort of the simple version of that chapter is find things that marketing is just something that comes for free, right? Mm -hmm. In a sense, like I don't really have to market Gumroad. Like for example, I tweeted today, like you can get a job at Gumroad without talking to a human. Uh, 100% async, no phone call, no coding interview, nothing like that. All async. Nice. Yeah, probably a million people will see that tweet. You know, I didn't mention Gumroad. Like I didn't use the handle. I didn't have a jobs listing. Like I'm not promoting it. I'm just saying, hey, this is something that we now do. <laughs> That's interesting to a lot of people. And it's interesting to me. I didn't think it was going to go viral, but it, it seemed to have. But you know, you never, you can never really predict these things. The chapter on sales, chapter four, sell to 100 customers is also has the most boring title name because it's the most boring thing you have to do to start a, and scale a business. But yeah, you, you want to find things where you can just kind of tell your friends, you can tell your community, you can just tell the people around you, Hey, I have this thing. I made this thing. It's all my problem. I always start with trying to solve my own problem. But then once you do that, you know, you should have like a built in audience already for that kind of content, right? Everything I build, even though I don't really think about it, I really am like, I just want to solve my own problem. I'm probably in a community where with like hundreds of other people that have that same problem, right? Because I, let's say I'm a VC, like I know hundreds of other VCs. If I start a business to solve some problem I have as a VC, there's probably quite a few people. And I did this recently. There's quite a few people who also have this problem. It's important to think about. I think the way that I frame it as well in, in the third chapter, build as little as possible. We're covering the whole book here. Try to build something that has some internal organic growth mechanism built into right. it, right? Gumroad, for example... Anytime you use Gumroad, you're kind of telling the world that Gumroad exists. Then I can really just focus on the initial snowball. And then over time, it'll kind of roll on its own, right? For me personally, just because over the long term, I want it to become a self-sustaining machine, like a sort of perpetual energy sort of thing. But I think in the beginning, you have to find something that you really enjoy. You're solving your own problem. Art inherently does that. But business, you kind of need the overlap of something that you have, but also a lot of other people have. And then hopefully it, it just kind of becomes kind of intuitive over time. How do I balance like building, marketing, selling? And my answer is like, you don't balance them. You do one at a time. First you build. I like having weekend projects. So like a weekend I'll spend building something or now, you know, I have a life and a wife and things. So, you know, maybe, you know, over the course of a week or two nights and weekends, something like that. But generally, you know, the goal being pretty darn fast to get to kind of an MVP, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't even mean coding. It could mean using Airtable and Zapier and things like that to kind of right. piece together a, a solution. But some sort of... I call it a manual valuable process. Something that has some utility value, That's but it's manual. It's a process. It's not a product. Just to lower the, the stakes for people. So spend like a few days doing that. Then you probably need to spend months, frankly, selling it, right? And the reason is you're not going to be... Your product's not going to have product market fit immediately. And I think the best way to get to product market fit is to try selling it to a customer, do it very manually, ideally in the highest fidelity way possible. No copy pasting, no automation. And then they'll say, sorry, it's not a fit for me. And then you fix that or you don't, right? You decide to or not. But then you do it again and then you do it again and then you do it again and you do it again and again and again until you get to a point where I, in the in the book, it's called a hundred customers, but you have repeat customers, you, you know, you have some measure that you're like, okay, I solved the problem. When I tell someone that I've solved it, they want to give me money for it. And then, great. Then you can move on to marketing. And then marketing is honestly something you could do for years. right? So Gumroad, I built in a weekend. I probably sold it manually for months. And then I've spent the last 10 years just like marketing the crap out of it. And it's like easy because I just go on Twitter and I say, Hey, I learned this thing today. My company is called Gumroad. <laughs> and therefore, some people will Google it or go to my Twitter bio or whatever. But you really don't have to hard sell it. One of the lines in the book that... I hope resonates with people is you shouldn't spend your time convincing people. You should spend your time finding people who are already convinced. That's kind of part of the sales chapter. I think like that's really important because you're just going to run out of energy that way. So are you spending the time teaching people or letting people know what you're working on? Like what's the gist of the marketing quote unquote? Like are you 
talking about how you solve people's problems? Are you talking about the pain? Are you just sharing like, here's what I'm working on? Or are you actually like teaching somebody how to do something using your tool? I think people have different takes and it probably is a little path dependent depending on what you're building and for what customer. Like, you know, if you're selling an enterprise software system, like my solution of tweeting random things about the company is probably not super effective. You might want to do webinars or like long form content marketing or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I think the important thing is you have to find something that it kind of comes for free. Like you like writing about this kind of stuff, right? Or you like tweeting or you like making TikToks or YouTube videos. <laughs> All right. But generally it's, it is social media, right? That is a pretty... At this point, it's either SEO or social media are kind of like the ways that you find things, right? Yep. Like you think about a new product that you've purchased. There's basically just a few ways that you heard about it. Either someone you follow on social media shared it. Either you Googled for like recipe and you found it or advertising. Someone paid for your eyeballs. Let's put out advertising because part of the goal here is to not spend money that you don't have, right? Because you want to get to sustainability as soon as possible. And so really, there's only two ways, SEO and social media. Those are really like the right. two ways to do it. Right. Which is kind of crazy if you think about it. I guess maybe a third way is like outreach, right? You just manually reach out to your customer. But that's more sales than, than marketing. And so yeah, marketing really kind of comes down to like providing valuable content, either in the short term or the long term. And I define value in sort of in the marketing chapter, sort of there's three tiers to it. The first tier is educational content which is I think where everyone should start because it's like the most functional value. It's the easiest to measure. It's the most objective. I can say, give me a tip on writing. I can give you 30, right? It's more sort of deterministic in that way. Second level is inspiration. So education is the first one. Inspiration is the second one. And that's like sharing your journey, sharing people like the struggle that you've had, this thing that you figured out. So it's kind of educational, but it's more just like inspiring people, right? Like a lot of what Elon tweets, It's not really educational, but it's satisfying. It feels good and it inspires me, at least me personally, right? It might not everybody. And then the third tier, you alluded to it earlier, is entertainment. Ultimately, a lot of what people spend their time on the internet for is entertainment. So if you can figure out a way to tie what you do into an entertainment sort of thing, which is like, if you look at my Twitter, I think people might not realize this, but like my Twitter is just jokes. (laughs) <laughs> they're just punchlines of jokes where I just don't think what a joke is. Even like, for example, this tweet that I had today, which feels very educational or maybe even inspiring, right? That you can now get a job at Gumroad without talking to a human, but it's also kind of funny. Right. You can't even cancel like a New York Times subscription without talking to a human. Like talking to a human is like a very kind of like thing that people don't like to do. And so I played with it. But it's like, well, you have to get a job. To get a job, you have to talk to a human. The great thing about entertainment is like your audience doesn't need to know that that you're trying to make a joke. <laughs> right. They sort of subconsciously will pick up on it because it's like, oh, he's not saying like at Gumroad, we have moved to a totally asynchronous model. And the reason we did that is <laughs> no, it's just like you can now get a job at Gumroad without talking to a human. And that resonates deeply with people. And it, I think it's because it, it satisfies some of these other things that a lot of other types of content don't satisfy. Mm. So, Would you say that some of your marketing around that specifically for software as a service businesses would be the feature does the marketing? Yeah. I mean, there's two ways I think to look at that. One is the a sort of fundamental part of it, which is inherently to use the product you have to tell other people. Like, for example, I built an app. This is almost 10 years ago. I built this little app called Caltrainer. So I lived in the Bay Area. I took the Caltrain every week. And like all the apps sucked. Like the website was super crappy. I had to like zoom in and pinch and all this, you know, back in the day with the iPhone, right? There are not that many iPhone apps back then. And so I literally just built an iPhone app that was like a nice Caltrain schedule. Like no functionality, like literally just like static text. I built it again, built it in a weekend, I think, um, at the Stripe office actually back in the day. But even then, I knew that this was inherently viral, right? Because guess what? Like if you're at the Caltrain stop or if you're in the Caltrain itself, like people will see, oh, what's that app that you're using? It's also good SEO because if you just go in the app store and you'll search for Caltrain and it'll be in the top five because there might be five apps that support the Caltrain. I wasn't building a train app for all the trains in the world. I was just trying to solve my own problem. Hmm. And even the book, like I I wanted to write a book that like people would be like, a friend of yours is like, man, I hate my job. Like I want to start like a business. It's like, hey, you should read this book. 
or like, Hey, what do you know about Zapier and no code? I like, what is Airtable? It's like, Oh, go read this book. Right. Like that's how I think about it. The other angle in terms of feature marketing is it's interesting. It's novel. Mm, yep. For example, I was talking to Natalie Nagel from Postmark Wildbit and her husband, we were together. Like th- they were saying that like, the hook that they figured out actually in part credited Gumroad for it because our customers really needed this specific feature was time to inbox is what they call it. Hmm. Speed, how fast, like a password reset email. You don't want in an hour. You want it immediately because then otherwise you get into support email. It's like, Hey, I didn't get my password reset. Right. And it's just <laughs> like, and so they figured out that like, Oh wow, we can build all of these features. But the thing that's going to get everyone to be like, Oh, this is different. They have a unique proposition for me, which is, Time to inbox. It's like a new term. You might not have heard it before. Hmm. It's novel. It's interesting. Right? right. They came up with the four day work week back in the day too. Nice. For example, like I cannot compete with Stripe or Amazon on hiring engineers who want to just make a ton of money or whatever. Right. And have a, an insane amount of impact, et cetera. But I can say, Hey, if you want to work 20 hours a week from anywhere and have no meetings, Gumroad's one of very few places. Yeah. And so you have to find like your unique angle that your hook that's going to be compelling to people. If you if you're right, you should learn this very quickly because it's the headline. Reflecting on my failure to build a billion dollar company is a good headline. No meetings, no deadlines, no full-time employees. The minimalist entrepreneur, right? Like you have to figure out what is the highest density set of words that describe your idea or set of ideas. And of course, I can't cover it all in the title. But there's a lot of people who might not even read the whole article or they might skim it, but they get the gist of it, right? They could even say if a friend is like, oh, I don't want to build a billion dollar company or like, oh, I hate VCs. It's like, hey, go read this article, right? It pokes fun. It's a meme. You can't fail to build a billion dollar company, but it's a hook. It's enough for people to be like, hmm, that's interesting. That's funny. Right. Right. And it's entertaining. It really like I wrote it to be entertaining. It wasn't like, here are the 50 things I learned starting and failing to build a billion dollar company. It was reflecting on my failure to build a billion dollar company. I'm going to tell you my story. And yes, hopefully it's educational. Hopefully it's inspiring, but it's also entertaining. It's also dramatic. There's a hero's journey. There's like failure. There's success. Right. Do sex mahina sort of out of the blue moment. I literally modeled it off of a hero's journey. So ultimately you have to make them laugh. You have to make them smile. And if you can also solve their problem at the same time, that's great. It's interesting to hear you talk about all these things in relation to writing tweets or a blog or a book because a lot of what YouTubers do is everything that you're saying bundled together, right? They try to make YouTube videos, you know, entertaining and novel and educational and <laughs> Yeah. Um, cool. And then to think about it across the spectrum, you actually have to storytell and do all these things no matter what piece of content you're putting out for it to really resonate with people and capture their attention. You do. Yeah. Part of what was really fun about writing the book was really just figuring out like, okay, well, what are the fundamentals? What are the primitives in a sense of marketing, of selling? Yeah. And sometimes it's really nothing. You know, it feels almost like, oh my gosh, I have to write a whole chapter on like cold emailing people and just being friendly and nice (laughs) and, you know, honest and accessible and transparent, et cetera. But turns out those are the core ingredients that go into all marketing education, inspiration, and entertainment. What would you say is the minimalist entrepreneur mindset when you're starting? Because I know there's a lot of things that you benefit from right now, having been through your experiences and and having the audience already and, and being able to do things that a normal person starting off would not be able to do. Yeah, no, it's a good thing to highlight because, you know, definitely, yeah, with 200,000 Twitter followers, like your kind of calculus on your approach might change. But, you know, the way that I started, I think, is is still pretty relevant even today. You know, 10 years in, it's probably relevant 10 years before that because everyone has the same journey, which is you learn some skills, you start contributing to communities, right? That might be a school, it might be your coworkers, your employer, it might be like a sports team or it might be a political party. Like everyone has communities that they're in, right? It might be their local church group. Like for me... It was Hacker News. I was contributing on Hacker News. I was writing blog posts, sharing my stuff. And you do that. You learn the skills. You you start helping people, right? You start contributing. And at first, you're just like lurking, right? You're just reading, uh, which is totally fine. And I assume most people like on Twitter are just reading, right? Those 200,000 people are not tweeting all day long. My guess is maybe 10% of them are tweeting. Yeah, you just start helping people. You just start helping people one by one. You start learning stuff. 
you start trying to solve your own problem. And then eventually you kind of connect all those dots and you say, okay, there's a business I can build for this community, which is great because it's not going to be impossible to sell this thing to strangers. Like I can just kind of sell it to these hundred people. I think as a mindset, I've always been really focused on sustainability in terms of profitability. And the reason I think that's so important is because like you kind of have to take a bunch of shots for a lot of these things to work out. Ultimately, what matters is that you succeed as an individual, as an entrepreneur, not that your business succeeds, right? Who cares? It's a business. It's like a made up legal abstract thing, right? And so it's pretty important, I think, to start with like, okay, how can I get to a place where I can commit my time and energy and focus? And that means like a base level of sort of income, right? And that might be working like I worked at Pinterest, or it might be freelancing three out of five days a week or whatever it may be. But I think you you want to focus on sort of that unlimited shots on goal, thing where you can start to kind of focus on taking these shots. Yep. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not a get rich quick scheme at all, right? Quite the opposite. And then yes, picking a community to build for. Building for yourself, I think is also really important, especially in the beginning, because you want that feedback loop, right? You don't want to build something and then say, hey, did I solve your problem? Right. You want to build something and be like, oh yes, it's better now because I know it's better because I need it t- takes me one minute instead of two minutes. And so I think that's really important. You don't always have to solve your own problem, but I do think in the beginning, it's, it is help, a helpful exercise for sure. That's interesting you say that. So earlier in our conversation, you said that the business side is for other people and the art is for yourself. But at the beginning of the business side, you're saying you really do have to scratch your own itch or have your own skin in the game, eat your own dog food, however you want to say it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to say that. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think over time, certainly, right? Like Gumroad is not solving my own problem, right? It's solving other people's problems. But I think in the beginning, it almost needs to be art in a way because there is no business case because it, right. <laughs> there was, you wouldn't be able to build a business. It would have already been built, right? Right. In the beginning, it is this very like almost art project, right? Where like Bitcoin was almost more like an art project in the beginning than it was right. like a business opportunity. Yep. And that's kind of, I think, where a lot of things have to start. They're almost like accidents of circumstance, which is why I think it's so hard. It is kind of random in a way where you start like a bunch of things. And the Gumroad was one of many and it worked. And in hindsight, you'd be like, oh, Sahil like knew that. Like, yeah, maybe. But like, I also had four other things I built in that few month period that no one knows about anymore because they all failed. The smartest people on earth still have a failure rate above 50%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.